Um, I'm glad to stand with you all before you all this morning. Sorry, having a little technical trouble. Um, we want to continue in our uh, series, um, which is uh, looking unto Jesus. And uh, we've been talking through um, the aspects um, of uh, the life of Christ, and we've been uh, covering different subtopics. I'm going to just give a quick overview of where we're at uh, for our, I know there are many guests here today. Um, wanted to kind of just a quick overview, and then I'll go into my topic. Um, Christ as the author and finisher of our faith. We talked about uh, the forerunners of Christ in different parts of the Old Testament. We talked about the birth and the li early life of Christ. And we plan to go through uh, his miracles, his teachings, his work on the cross, and, and his uh, uh, resurrection and, and, and the future and in eternity as we study the series. As we're right now, we're parked in this subtopic called entry into public ministry. And specifically within that, we talked about different things. Last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, calling of disciples. So one of the things that Jesus did as part of his entry into his ministry was he called uh, the 12 disciples. And what we know or don't talk about a lot is there, there is a group of dis beyond the apostles, there were a group of other followers and disciples that moved along with Christ. Some of them we know fell away at different points when uh, things got too hard or, you know, when he said something they didn't agree with, um, they just fell away, right? So, but the point is that Christ um, anointed and called certain people and as, uh, basically assigned uh, anointing or uh, gifts upon them uh, to carry out his ministry uh, for when he was here and also to continue that after his return to heaven. Okay, so, so within that, we talked about the last few weeks, uh, you know, different disciples who were called at different times. And uh, myself and uh, Minu, we talked about the inner circle and their calling and their life uh, through that calling, right? Uh, while as displayed in the gospel, we talked about Peter and then James and John. And we know these different categories of disciples uh, that were also part of the 12 apostles. Uh, we have, you know, Matthew, Andrew, Philip, and Nathaniel, who, whose calling was, is described, but not much is said about their life, you know, while Jesus was here. And then there were four other apostles beyond those four, which was Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, and Judah, brother of James, uh, that their calling is not uh, described, but we know their names are either listed or different glimpses of them are mentioned in the Bible, especially uh, the apostle Thomas, who I'll touch on at the end of my uh, message today. And finally, we know Judas was a betrayer, and he was replaced by Matthias, and so that rounds out the group of 12. And we also have a question of Paul, who called himself uh, based on the calling of Christ uh, as an apostle. So that is what you call the apostles in the Bible. But I want to point uh, your attention to uh, Luke chapter 10. Um, I'm going to read uh, the first verse. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So this is actually an interesting passage because you see an almost replica of it in the previous chapter in verse 9, except in that passage, he does the same thing. He anoints the 12 apostles, right, and sent them out two by two and to do miracles and heal the sick and to prophesy. And then now 
Here, after several days, he's doing a similar action with these 70. And what, what uh, I wondered why did he do this? Why is it the same replication of what he did with the apostles happening here? And why is it 70? Why, what, why is it, uh, some of your versions say 72, uh, mine says 70, so I'm gonna stick with 70 because that fits with my message. Um, I'm not gonna get into the complexity of 70 versus 72, but, but let's just go with 70. Um, so why did he choose these 70 disciples and send them out, and we know, you know, we know the story, right? They were told to not carry anything with them, don't take an extra change of clothing, go into all these uh, different cities and bring the gospel of peace. And if they receive you, uh, abide with them, don't go around to different houses, stay with that house, right? And if there's a son of peace, who receives you? And if they don't, that's, you know, shake off the dust of that city from your feet. It'll be worse for that city at the end times than for Sodom and Gomorrah. So that was the message. So my focus here today is, what was Christ doing actually? And what does that mean for us today, right? So why 70, what was he doing? Um, so I'm gonna actually uh, go take you to a, a worldly example first. Uh, there's a company called Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S. Um, H-E-R-M-E-S, Hermes, it's a French company. They've existed for almost 200 years. And they make very luxurious, very expensive things that I certainly can't afford or won't want to afford. Um, uh, women's purses and scarves and all these things. I'm, when I say expensive, I'm talking about $40,000 for a purse, okay? So this is expensive, okay? It's not like you can go to the outlet mall here and grab one. So, so. Uh, so, but for 200 years, they have maintained the quality of their products. They didn't make purses always. They started with making saddles. But either way, 200 years, the philosophy of the company has not changed, okay? Unlike their competitors, what they've done and perfected is that they only make their products through trained craftsmen, okay? And whereas other competitors like Louis Vuitton, maybe some of you have those purses. Um, you might get that one at the Outlet Mall, I don't know. Uh, so uh, they actually mass produce their purses, right? Through, they take advantage of modern technology and they mass produce those purses. But Hermes has decided, I am not gonna do that. We are not gonna do that. It, it's still owned by a family and it's worth like $200 billion as a company value. But what they have perfected is, they're going to train craftsmen and it takes like three years to get to a point where they can be trusted with making a purse, an Hermes purse, which is like a very desired a product by rich people, okay? So, but it takes three years and it's only made in France and they have these specific sites where they make these purses from start to finish. These craftsmen make these purses, that's it, nobody else. And that is their strategic competitive advantage. That is why nobody can copy the brand, nobody can copy the, you know, the product quality and all these various things of why everybody craves an Hermes bag, okay? So my topic is not Hermes, okay? So, or purses or anything like that. My point is what Jesus was doing was he was anointing craftsmen who can continue the legacy of the, gospel, the kingdom of God, amen? Which he came to establish on the earth, okay? We see the same thing happen in uh, Numbers chapter 11. Um, so what happened was Moses, well, his father-in-law, many times we get wisdom from our in-laws. Uh, <laughs> just take that for what it's worth. Uh, so Mo Moses was just overwhelmed, right? He had just too much on his plate. He was you know, resolving all these big and small disputes and he was just so worn out and burnt out. And 
Jethro was like, why are you doing this? Why don't you delegate this responsibility by appointing elders, right? And so Moses did that, and you can read um, uh, chapter 11, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them into the tabernacle of the con congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. See, Moses had gotten to a point earlier in verse 14 of that same chapter. He, he just cried out to God and said, I'm not able to bear all this people alone. It is too heavy for me. And he even said, if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray you, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. He had gotten to such a miserable position that I cannot take care of all these people. So that's when God said, why don't you appoint 70 people who I can pour my spirit upon, that same spirit that is upon you, so they can judge the people along with you. He is still over them, but they're going to be working for you to divide the burden that you have. In a sense, Jesus was doing this. The key difference that Jesus was not overwhelmed. He did not get wearied by the burden that was before them. In fact, when he commissioned these 70 disciples, he next said, what? In verse 2 of Luke, back in Luke chapter 10, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into this har his harvest. He was not worn out or tired or anything like that or overwhelmed by the task before him. But he was merely saying, I see before me all of these people that need to hear the gospel. And the task of bringing it to them does not just lie with Christ. It lies with anointed men and women of God. These craftsmen that I want to carry the legacy of the kingdom of God down through generations. Unadulterated. Preserved perfectly like I was talking about the Hermes business model. I want to carry the legacy of faith down through generations through craftsmen who will not dilute the word of God but rather carry themselves forth with the anointing that is in me. Amen. It's the same spirit that was in Christ now rests upon each of us. Amen. Now rests upon each of us to carry that legacy forward. You all believe that? Do you believe that Jesus anointed us with the same spirit that worked in him? Amen. And th that's why these 70 disciples went forth and they went to these villages and they were amazed like they had never seen such a thing before. It's one thing to see Jesus do this, right? But imagine people who had never had exposure to something like that before Jesus lay hands on somebody and they got healed. They cast out demons and they were, uh, uh, they were relieved of those demons. They prophesied and, and edified and all these things that they thought only Jesus could do. But this is the calling of God in your lives. So God wants to do great and mighty things through, through you. He's waiting for you to respond to that call. Amen. He wants to train these craftsmen. Yes, there's a time of training and waiting. Like uh, the example of Hermes. There is a time that you had to go through of trial and testing. But on the other side, you're going to make these beautiful works for God. You're going to do some beautiful things for God. How beautiful are they whose feet bring the gospel of Christ. Amen. He is looking for us to step forward into this craftsmanship. Amen. He is looking to fulfill the work he started on the earth.
When, uh, I'm gonna use another worldly example. See, uh, they came back and they were so happy with this and Jesus was like, hold up. You think that is great, but even greater, it's not greater that the demons submit to you because I saw the devil falling like lightning. He's no big deal. I got him covered, right? That's not a big deal. But rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. Amen? And then Christ just, at that point, he got overwhelmed in the spirit. In verse 21 to 24, he says, I thank to you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes because it seemed good in your sight. And then later in verse 24, or 23 and 24, blessed are the eyes that would see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see these things which you see and have not seen them. And hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. See, it didn't start that day. But he merely pulled the curtain away to show them a reality that had been set in motion before the foundations of the world. So last year, uh, I think it was last year, November or something, a company called OpenAI announced uh, artificial intelligence to the whole world. Right? And, and everybody's like, whoa, what is going on here? Right? And it was just chaos. Everybody was like, wow, this is the game changer. Maybe I could lose my job. AI is going to take my job or whatever. Right? But it was revealed to everybody on one day. But did they work on that that week? Did AI just happen overnight? No. It's years and decades of incremental improvement. Right? The same way Jesus is saying, yes, you're blessed because you see this. There are many prophets who came thousands of years ago before you who hoped to see this. You're just merely seeing the fulfillment of the promise of God. This was set in motion way before your time. But you're so blessed because you have this call of God in your life. And that's my message to you today listening to me is, you are so blessed. I am so blessed because this spirit, this same spirit rests upon me. This craftsmanship rests upon me to continue to preserve the legacy of the kingdom of God. Amen? The question that he's asking us and challenging us is, how are we going to respond to this call? You all with me? Amen. All right. So I'm going to take you to another place here today real quick. Um, Exodus chapter 15. Because I was wondering why 70? There's a curious um, reference here. It's only like a couple of verses this place is mentioned in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 15 verse 27. And they came to Elam where were 12 wells of water and three score or 70 uh, palm trees and they encamped there by the waters. So they came to this place. This was after the place of Mara, where the water was bitter, right? And they had to take a tree and dump it into the water, right? It became sweet. And now they came to another place called Elam, which was like a place of rest. And there were 12 wells of water and exactly 70 palm trees. That one, I believe, is 70, not 72. So just saying. So... Uh, so there were 12 wells and 70 palm trees. So, whoa, what does this all mean? And then you go back and read Luke uh, chapter uh, 9. There were 12 apostles who were commissioned and sent out. And almost in the same way, there were 70 disciples in chapter 10 we've been talking about sent out. Is there any correlation? Well, possibly, right? This doesn't really spell it out, but a little bit of... Studying showed, maybe showed me a glimpse of why 12 and 70. See, God, like I was saying, this didn't happen overnight. What was the desire in the heart of God? Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. Amen? Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. Why did I say that? Because... How many people 
went into Egypt from, uh, from the time of Jacob? 70, you come on, thank you. There are 70 people that went in that represented the nation of Israel. God didn't forget. He sent out 70 disciples to, what, evangelize Israel then. But I think it goes beyond that. If you read Genesis chapter 10, there's a whole table of nations that came out of Noah from his three sons. And there's, again, this is from my study, you can disagree with me, but I think it's related. Um, there's 70 nations listed there and 70 tongues. And so a lot of people, Bible scholars believe that when the, right after Genesis 10, Genesis 11, when the Tower of Babel happened and the language was split up, there were 70 different nations and tongues that they were split into. So I believe that this is a representation of the heart of God. Because Jesus was seeing from there till Revelation chapter 5, where he saw multiple nations and tongues worshiping God together. That was where he was headed towards. That's where he had his eyes set on. That's why he said, look, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are so few. I'm, I'm starting it off with you, 70. It's your job to maintain this craft like Hermes did. It's your job to pass this down through generations. It's your job to multiply this 70 into 490 and whatever the square of 490 is. To multiply many, many times to bring the gospel to the nations. Because God did not forget his promise to Adam in the garden. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Amen? And that's why Moses said, a prophet will come after me that is greater than me. And him you will listen. Amen? There is a pattern of God throughout the whole Bible. Amen? But it's all centered on the promise of God, the love of God that is never changing. That's why he sent his son to die for us. So um, I'm going to wrap up here quickly. Why just, uh, I just, I was curious, so going further into the palm trees, why palm trees, right? Why couldn't it be another tree? So, you see, there's so, I think, I believe there are like a hundred different species of palm trees. And uh, I grew up in the Middle East, and the palm trees were everywhere, okay? And they produce something called dates, right? You can get them in Costco now, like a big tub of it. Uh, but, so, these dates, so, if you, if you read up on it, it's said that if these palm trees did not exist, it would have been impossible for civilization to expand into places that are so hot and dry. Palm trees are, is, so the dates produced by these palm trees are so dense with nutrients and sustenance for people who live in there, right? So palm trees and, and the wells that nourish the apostles as the foundation of the God, kingdom of God, right? Nourishing the next generation of the 70 disciples, right? Nourishing the palm trees that produce the dates that sustain um, the generations to come to continue the traf, uh, craft the producing the fruit to sustain us. That's why palm trees. You can bring palm trees to other places. The difference is the palm trees really only produce dates in abundance in hot and dry climate. Amen. We, we have brought palm trees here to America in the land of abundance, but they don't really produce the same type of dates, or most of them don't produce dates. If you go to the 23rd Street, you can see some fake palm trees outside of the Chinese market, right? So there's all kinds of palm trees. Um, my point, I'll finish with this, is I'll come back to the apostles, is coming back to where our church has been. So one of the apostles who were called was Thomas. We always know him as Doubting Thomas, right? But in fact, maybe he had a moment of doubt about Christ, but the rest of his life was no way 
reflecting uh, doubts. Because he, I think, may have gone the furthest of any other apostles. He went, he took the gospel to, we know that, took the gospel to India. And some say he went to China and came back to India. But he evangelized uh, southern parts of India, our own state of Kerala, right? And then eventually went to Chennai and was martyred in Chennai. He sowed the seed and planted some churches there in, uh, in southern parts of India. But those churches um, produced dates then, but over time became a relic and were no longer producing fruit, right? Again, we know that uh, in the 1900s, a revival happened and our forefathers came to Christ through that and many times came out of nominal versions of Christianity and awakened and came back to uh, uh, following the gospel, right? But the question is, and the government of India actually even produced a stamp in his honor uh, in 1964, I didn't know this, of the Apostle Thomas. But the question is, have we carried that legacy from by preserving the craft? Or have, are, 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 is our churches becoming a relic? Are we just known as a stamp that somebody can remember by, right? I feel like we've come to a point where, you know, we have the earlier generation that came here, want to preserve the culture, and then there's a generation that's growing up here that is battling the, you know, the culture here and trying to toe the line between the two. But all of that doesn't matter. The question is, are we preserving the anointing and call, training up new generations of disciples, right? We're bearing the burden of Christ, right? Are we, are we trying to maintain an iron grip on culture or are we enabling new generations of disciples? This is a call for the old and the young. What is stopping us from stepping forward to preserving the craft? The same mind that Christ had at the beginning. What is holding us back to taking the calling of Christ to the next generation? How are we going to preserve? How are we going to be like palm trees making dates? Or are we going to be like the fake ones on 23rd Street? Right? How do we want to be remembered? May his name be glorified. Amen.